The Bible says, go well, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That is the only time in Scripture that we're told to clap our hands in worship. But there are many times in Scripture when the Bible says, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Lift up your voice in the sanctuary. Lift up a loud voice. So I thank the Lord for the clapping of the hands. But I wish you'd get your hands in the air and use your voice to just give Jesus glory and honor, worship and praise, adoration. He is a word. What a privilege it is to be in the Philippines once again. You are wonderful, beautiful people. And we thank God around the world for the way He is using this great church. You not only bless this country, you have blessed almost every country on the face of the planet. I'm from Canada. Many of the new churches that are being planted are being planted by wonderful Filipino pastors and great saints of God. And God is using this revival to seed revival all around the world. Thank you for being the great church that you are. It's a privilege to be here with Pastor and Sister Mickey Mangan, the POA team. Isn't this worship team absolutely wonderful and anointed? We're so grateful they're here and all of the speakers. And as you're standing this morning, I want to read two scriptures. The Apostle Paul writing, and he says to the group of Christians serving God in Galatia, in the provinces of Rome, he says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. We often quote this verse to our young people because it is in the middle of a passage where Paul is giving instructions to Christians on living a godly life. And we talk to them as they begin to date and they look toward marriage. And we read them this scripture. But this morning, this is not just a dating or courtship or marriage scripture. It's for all of us. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Today I bring you a word that God laid on my heart just this past weekend. And I want to share it with you in light of what God did so magnificently last night. What a powerful and beautiful and liberating move of God we were in in this place last night. And I thank God for it. The devil doesn't like it when we have liberty. The devil always fights back against freedom in the Holy Ghost. The devil would like to snatch already. He's on duty this morning. He'd like to snatch away any victory that you get at because of the times. But here's the thing. He doesn't know who he's dealing with. We're not going to let him snatch away the Word of God and the move of God. I preach to you this morning, the anointing destroys the yoke. Would you lift your hands one more time? Not just do a little P.S. prayer, but would you lift your hands and lift your voice and give God glory? Everything you have for us today, Jesus, we want it. Everything you have for us, we want it. You may be seated. Originally, a yoke was a primitive device fashioned from wood, primitive metals. And it was used to join together a pair of animals, especially oxen. But over time, as societies developed, the yoke began to have other uses. It became a frame that a person would actually put on their shoulders if they wanted to carry a pair of buckets with water or some other substance. But eventually, as time went on, the yoke began to develop a sinister meaning. It became a symbol of slavery. When the Roman Empire conquered much of the ancient world, 
they would build huge arches and they called those a yoke. And as they conquered people, they would march prisoners into their cities underneath the yoke, underneath the arch. And it was a symbol of slavery. In the world of machinery, a yoke actually means a vice-like piece. It, it pushes two other pieces together. It holds them firmly in place. And so over time, a yoke has come to mean this. It is something that binds. It is something that burdens. It is something that weighs down the people of God. And along the way, the word yoke, somewhere in history, became a verb. And to yoke means to join, or to couple, to harness, to link, to unite, or to attach. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people that know, love, and serve Jesus. And he says, don't you be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Don't let your life be attached to anything else. You were set free from all of that, so don't go back there. Don't join yourself to those things once again. That's why he said, don't be unequally yoked together. Let me pull that verse away from the world of our young people and let me apply that to all of us who lead and serve in God's church. Anytime there's an unequal yoke to something in the world, to something that's the mentality of this carnal world, we put a drag on our ministries. We put a weight on our churches. We, we put a downdraft that keeps pressing us down from the purpose of God. Yokes create a burden in your spiritual life. They put you off balance with the weight that you're carrying. And so I came to this first session of this second day of Because of the Times to ask the great ministers and leaders, the great young people and families in this auditorium, Amen. what is your yoke? What is the burden that you are joined to? What is dragging you down as you attempt to serve God in His kingdom? What is it that you feel the weight of every single day? What is it that has been part of your life for a long time and you feel like you cannot get out from under it no matter how much you try? And it's a yoke. It chafes your shoulders. It burdens your back. It bows your head down, spiritually speaking. And I don't know what it is for you but you feel like you're attached to it. You feel like you can't get free. I don't know what your yoke is, but you know exactly what it is because you live with it every day. You try to minister with it hanging on every day. We're human beings. I don't know what your yoke is. Maybe it's something someone said to you or about you when you were a child. And their words, maybe it was your parents, their words messed you up. And you've borne that yoke all these years. You've always felt insufficient. You've always felt less than other people. You've always felt like you were not worthy. You've carried that all these years. You carry it in your mind as you try to do ministry. You carry it in your spirit as you try to lead God's church. Maybe they were unfortunate words. Or maybe... Someone said intentionally harmful words to you. And every time you look in a mirror, when you get up in the morning, you hear those words about yourself, they are always with you. But maybe your yoke is worse than that. Maybe your yoke is something, not that someone said, maybe it's something that somebody did to you. Maybe it was hurtful. Maybe it was abusive. Maybe it was so evil that you never speak of it. And you have carried that yoke for years. You love Jesus. You follow His call. You've given your heart. You serve His church. And you keep that yoke well hidden as you go to work for Him. You keep it deeply buried as you go about your daily routine. But if you were honest, you would say, but I feel that yoke all the time. It's a yoke. It's a burden. It's like you're tied to something that happened 
way in your past and you've never been able to get past it even though you love God with all your heart. It's like you're joined to something that you desperately wish you could get loose of. But that's never worked for you. And every once in a while, when you're all alone, when you're hurting, when you're angry, when you're tired, the devil brings that yoke back to haunt you. And he puts it right in your face as though it happened yesterday. You can hear those words. You can feel those feelings. You can remember those moments. And it's like you can't get free. Maybe your yoke is even worse than that. Maybe your yoke is a personal failure. It's not something somebody did to you. It's something you did to yourself. And that devil, who is a sinister, cruel, ruthless, unethical foe, he takes every chance he can get to bring that up and remind you of your failure. He brings it back. What you did that hurt your ministry. What you said that messed you up. What you did that crippled your future. What you did that is so embarrassing that you've worked for a lifetime to try to just hide it. Every day. The devil tries to remember and remind you of your failure. He reminds you when you come to church and the pastor or the worship leader says, everybody lift your hands and your hands stay at your side. It's not because you're rebellious. It's not because you don't like to worship God. It's because you feel so bound and you feel ashamed and you feel worthless and unworthy. It's not that you're disobedient. It's not that you wouldn't worship God. It's that you feel like you're not worthy to worship God. You're not worthy to be a leader. You're not worthy to be a pastor. You're not worthy to be used by God. Let me tell you something. There is no bigger lie told by the devil to the people of God than that lie right there. We don't worship him because we are worthy. We worship him because he is worthy. We're not here because we are good. We're here because he is good. We're not serving him because we are perfect. But we look at him and we say he is perfect. So just because it pleases God and blesses you and frustrates the devil, I wish despite whatever you are feeling this morning, you would lift up your hands right now and you would lift your voice higher than your hands and you would just give God a praise. He is worthy of your praise. He is the good and great and perfect one and he is always forever worthy. Maybe your yoke has been with you so long that it's kind of distorted your personality. Maybe you feel like it's damaged your spiritual life. Maybe you live in fear every day. It's tangible. You can feel it. And little triggers in your life, they set you off. It's been with you so long, you cannot remember not having this yoke in your life. And you say to yourself, I've always felt this way. I have people that have said to me, Pastor, I've always been depressed. That's a lie, but they feel that. Right. I've never had joy. Not true, right. but they feel that way. I've never walked in victory. Not true, but they feel that way. The devil keeps bringing it back to their mind. God could never use me. That's a lie from the pit of hell, but the devil keeps telling you that. The devil's always trying to drag us back to our past, to our worst moments, to our days of defeat, to our moments of doubt, to weeks of wilderness and weeks of weakness. And he likes to take your face and grind your face in your situation. He's a cruel and a powerful foe. But I stand here this morning to remind me and all of us, the devil is not the Lord of me. The devil is not the boss of me. The devil does not control my life. He does not control my future. The devil cannot put a limit on me that my God cannot shatter and break. The devil is powerless in the face of hell. The 
devil's voice means less than nothing in my life. But the voice of Jesus means everything in my life. Maybe your yoke is something that hinders your mobility and your movement. Maybe your yoke is something that ties you and binds you. You feel like it holds you down and it trips you up and it makes you fall. In the Bible, if you think about a yoke, there was nothing wrong with the oxen. It was that burden that was placed upon them. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a human being with weaknesses and failures like every other human being. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just the yoke that's on you. That's what's wrong. Maybe you're a pastor serving God. And you're trying to lead God's church. Pastor touched on it last night and I thank God for what he said. There is a great need in this day. If we're going to have an apostolic church in the day that we have to face, we have to have a move of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul was brilliant. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was a, an incredible intellect. But he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. The Apostle Paul, when he went to prayer, he didn't just pray in his natural tongue of Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek. He was brilliant. He could have prayed in all those languages, but he said, when I go to prayer, I pray in the Spirit. That's why he said, I'll pray with the understanding, but I'm also going to pray in the Spirit. There is something in this meeting this week that wants to set every pastor, every pastor's wife, every young person, every child of a pastor, every leader in the church. There's something in this meeting that wants to set you free. Not so you can be blessed, so you can go to war in the Spirit. It was months after the Exodus it was long after they'd been delivered from their slave masters in Egypt. Long after they had crossed the Red Sea. Long after they had said goodbye to Pharaoh and the brick kilns and the pyramids. But the children of Israel, even though God had done so much for them, they were still thinking like slaves and acting like slaves and living like slaves. And that's why God sent His own people this strong word through the man Moses. Leviticus 26 and 13. I am the Lord your God. I brought you forth out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke and I have made you go upright. That was the message of God to people who were free but didn't realize they were free. Who were free but didn't act like they were free. Who were free but didn't live like they were free. God said, stand up. You don't have to be bound down with that yoke anymore. You don't have to act like a slave and live like a slave. You're a free people. Every once in a while, just to please God and bless yourself and frustrate the devil, you just need to get something in your spirit that declares, Satan, I don't have to take this anymore. I am not going to go like this back to my church serving God with a whole lot of blessing in my heart, but a whole lot of burden on my back. I am going to stand up. I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to walk back in authority and anointing. Paul said, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Don't you be entangled again with the yoke of the ball. The Filipino people, you are such beautiful people, such godly and great people. And you have so many wonderful characteristics that people around the world, nations around the world admire. You love to serve. You are so kind. You are so filled with faith. 
and you are such worshiping people and you inspire us around the world not just in the church world but nations admire your nation but every once in a while the kind serving gentle smiling joyful Filipino people every once in a while you just need to clench your fist in your spirit look strange to clench your fist and lift it up but if in your heart, if in your spirit, you can get your fist clenched like you were going to punch the devil right in the face and say devil, I am done see, the devil's business is to keep you from knowing who you are you are the people of God you are the apostolics you are the end time church. You are anointed. You are appointed. You have strength in you to beat the devil, to banish any foe. Every once in a while, you just have to realize, wait a minute, I have a right to fight. You might not be a fighter by nature. You might not be a fighter by personality. But you've got to realize in the spirit you have a right to resist what the devil is doing. You have a right to push back against the attack on your family. You have a right to stand up when he attacks your church and your ministry. God has broken the yoke that is holding you down, keeping you back, binding your spirit, wrecking your life. You don't have to put up with that any. More. God said, I have broken the bands of your yoke. Now stand up. If I've broken the bands of your yoke, stop walking with your spiritual posture like this. Stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Healing and miracles. It's amazing. They were included in the Old Testament covenant that God gave to Abraham. There were healings in the Old Testament. There were miracles in the Old Testament. And that's why in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus healed that little woman who had been bowed over for 18 years, do you, do you know what he did? It's not even so much that he healed her, he just made an announcement to her. Look at this, Luke 13, 11. Behold, there was a woman. She had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. She was bowed over. She couldn't even lift herself upright. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said, Woman, you're loosed from your infirmity. And when they challenged him in verse 16, here's what Jesus said. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 years, if she's a daughter of Abraham, and healing and miracles were in the covenant that God gave to Abraham, he said, I just say, shouldn't she be loosed? She owns that. She possesses that. It's not so much that Jesus did some great big healing. He just announced to her, daughter of Abraham, in the covenant you're under, there are healings. In the covenant you're under, there are miracles. So if you're a daughter of Abraham, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to look like this. You don't have to walk like this. You can stand up. And she stood up. Got better news than that. The writer of Hebrews says in the New Testament, in this church, we've got a greater covenant and a greater tabernacle and a greater sacrifice and a greater high priest. So if she could be set free under the old covenant, what in the world do you think could happen this week under the new covenant in every pastor's home, in every pastor's life, in every leader's family? If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, I'd like you to lift your voice right now and pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. If you're not speaking in tongues right now, let me announce to you, there's a renewing coming your way. There's a renewing coming your way. Lift up your head. Lift up your voice. Lift up your heart and pray in the Spirit. 
bondages are breaking this week. Bondages are breaking in this week. You're not a physical being having a spiritual experience a couple of times a week. You are a spiritual being. Two-thirds of you is invisible. You are body, soul, and spirit. Two-thirds of you, the greatest part of you, we can't even see. Right. You're a spiritual being right now having a physical experience for a few years on earth. That's why you've got to give the greatest attention in your life to the spiritual realm. You've got to give the greatest portion of your time to the things of God. You can't just live in the physical and expect the spiritual to happen. But here's the thing. The devil uses the physical to try to hinder the spiritual. Sickness is physical. We understand that. But when you have a yoke, a crippling paranoia and fear, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. This sickness is going to kill me. I'm never going to recover. That's not just physical anymore. The devil is using the physical to affect the spiritual. Our good doctors have helped us understand in the modern world that depression can have physical causes. That depression can have chemical causes in the brain. We understand that. And we thank God for our good doctors. But when depression goes on and on and gets deeper and darker, week after week after week, let me tell you, the devil is using the physical to try to attack the spiritual. Yeah. And we all face circumstances and opposition and situations. And that's just part of being a physical being in a physical universe. But when your situations bow you over with paranoia and they cripple you with fear and you feel like you can't do anything for God until you get through that trial, that's no longer just a physical trial. That is a spiritual attack. The devil tries to use the physical to get to the most important part of you. The devil will attack your home to get to your mind. The devil will attack your possessions to get to your heart. The devil will attack your church to try to get in the spirit. He's trying to bind you with a yoke of oppression. But the good news about this Jesus we serve, he can destroy any, you hear me, any Good godly men have differing opinions on this next little part. Good godly men have a difference of viewpoint, and that's okay. Because we're one body. And we can have difference of viewpoint and not break fellowship over. All right. There are good godly men who believe in something called generational curses. That somebody did something in the past and it flows down through a family tree and it affects everybody in the present and everybody in the future. I'm not trying to set up some kind of doctrinal debate, but I'll just tell you personally, I don't believe that generational curses have strength and power over God's people, and here's why. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I don't care what my great-grandfather did. If he served the devil, I can make a different decision and I can serve God. And the blessings of God come on my family. I don't care if your father was addicted and your mother was unfaithful. It doesn't have to affect you. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And here is where those good godly men would agree with me and I would agree with them. Even those who believe in generational curses would tell you this. Jesus has the power to break any generational curse. 
even if it's true, even if it's existing, even if it's so strong, Jesus can break it. Isaiah 54, verse 17. Filipino church, great UPC of the Philippines, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that tries to rise against you, God is going to condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. There's a man named Samson in your Bible. Samson made so many mistakes, it's hard to pick just one. Samson made so many mistakes, committed so many sins, took so many wrong turns. It's hard to just say that was the worst moment of his, mo of his life. All of his moments were bad after a while. And Samson ended up in a prison house with his eyes poked out, going around and around and around and around, grinding wheat for the Philistines. And his life was over that moment. He had lost everything that was precious through his own bad mistakes. He had lost everything that was good through his own evil actions. Samson. And Samson's anointing leaked out of his life and he didn't even realize it had leaked out of his life. Samson's anointing leaked out to the point where one day he tried to shake himself. He tried to do what he'd always done and it just felt empty. He tried to do what he'd always done and it just felt like he was going through motions that had no power. And Samson ends up in a prison house grinding for the enemy. Samson didn't even realize it when his anointing leaked out. He just woke up one day and it was empty. It was gone. Maybe you've had an experience like that as you've served God and as you've tried to serve His kingdom and you've tried to lead. And you've been doing everything you knew to do. But one day you just woke up. One day you just realized that the enemy had attacked your family while you were preaching your sermons. The enemy had kind of messed up your children while you were trying to lead God's church. You just woke up one day and you felt like every ounce of anointing had leaked out of your life. And here's what I came to preach to you this morning. For months now, you felt that you're all bowed over. You felt like there's a yoke, a burden, a huge weight on your back. And you've been trying to do all the right things. You've been serving God, singing your songs, preaching your sermons, praying for other people. And all the time, the devil has been in your face saying, look at you. You're trying to lead, but your family's a mess. You're trying to preach, but look, you didn't get your prayer answered. You're trying to have a move of God, but you didn't get your miracle yet. And you feel like that anointing that was so precious has leaked out of your life. And you're so thrilled to be here, but actually it's a little frustrating to be here because you watch others get a blessing. You watch others feel what they feel. You watch others do what they do. You watch men and women of God use powerfully and you say, God, that used to be me. God, I want that to be me. God, why isn't that me? And you feel like there's a yoke, there's a burden, and it cripples you and you're all bent over. Samson didn't realize. He was so busy doing his thing. He didn't realize when the anointing leaked out of his life. He just woke up one day and it was bad. He just woke up one day and he was burdened. He just woke up one day and there was a yoke on his back. But here's what else Samson didn't realize. He didn't realize that while he was in that place and he was repenting before God. And while he was grinding, going around and around in a mill for the enemy, he didn't realize that while he was grinding with a yoke on his back, his hair started to grow. Samson didn't realize that in the middle of the driest time in his life, in the middle of the worst wilderness of his life, in the middle of the deepest, darkest valley of his life, here's what else he didn't notice. His anointing came back. In the middle of the struggle, in the middle of the sickness, in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the attack, here's what you might not have noticed. Your anointing has come back. It's just sitting there, but it's waiting for you to say, wait a minute, I don't have to live like this. I don't have to pastor like this. I don't have to lead like this. The word of God to you is, stand up and let that yoke fall off. That's the word of God to you today. Stand up. It's going to be a great day. Stand up. God's going to use you. Stand up. You're going to be part of this great million soul.
7. You're still acting like slaves. You're still living like slaves. You're still thinking like slaves. But it's going to come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder. And the yoke of the enemy is going to be taken from off your neck. But wait a minute, wait a minute. The Bible doesn't say that the anointing will break the yoke. We say that. The Bible says the anointing, it's going to destroy the yoke. It's not just going to break it and leave it laying at your feet so you can trip over it again. It's going to destroy the yoke and let you walk free. I wish you'd grab the hand of the person beside you. Make a long chain of uplifted hands. Everybody, everybody, grab somebody's hand and lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. Yokes are being destroyed today. Yokes are being destroyed this morning. Yokes are being obliterated about the leaders and the pastors and the people. It's yours. It's yours. Stand up.
walk out like this. You get somebody by the hand and say, come on and dance with me. We're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to celebrate Jesus. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. 